Greetings to all you good people out there and welcome to Blockchains Online Live, volume number three. My name is Anke Misfeld. I'm your host. This show is brought to you by Blockchain, Central Europe's biggest AI, blockchain and sustainable tech platform. Blockchains Online Live is a worldwide broadcasted live talk show in the fields of artificial intelligence and blockchain technology related towards sustainability. And for each show, we will invite um, inspiring speakers and innovative thought leaders to discuss with them the current and future developments within these fields. And most importantly, to see how we can use and leverage these uh, disruptions towards a more fair and sustainable future. So stay tuned with us and learn more about what's happening here on Blockchains Online Live. Blockchains Online Live is a collaborative open platform and we want you to be a part of it. So make sure you subscribe to our newsletter and our Telegram channel so you can keep um, so we can keep you updated and you can give us your suggestions and feedback uh, so we can improve from show to show and uh, involve your thoughts and ideas in that. Um, you can also be directly a part within this show um, by typing your questions to our guests uh, directly in your chat. And um, we will pick out the best fittings uh, ones and ask them at the end of the show. Oh, and before I forget it, uh, we again have a Blockchain Conference 2021 ticket giveaway in the middle of the show. I will ask a question and the first one who gets to answer it will be the winner of the ticket. So stay tuned for that as well. And now let me introduce to you today's topic. And I'm really excited because it is a big one and an important one and a most recently very, very actual one. So our topic is the evolution of democracy. We're talking about e-voting governance and blockchain. So we will have uh, three different parts, I would say. We will talk about blockchain-based voting, uh, how it works and why it is tamper-proof. We will discuss how the blockchain technology can revolutionize existing governance models in private organizations and public institutions. And we will also examine why an effective governance is crucial for every blockchain network and what needs to be considered to design it in the right way. So before I get started, I would like to thank the participants and my guests to be here with us on the show. And now let me introduce to you today's guests. My first guest is Emanuel, Max Emanuel Schwarzer. He is working at the IT Research and Development Department at DAXA, a German logistics company. He's a PhD student at the Technical University of Dortmund. His research focus is on DLT governance and the question how to develop governance models for inter-organizational DLT business networks. So exactly the perfect person to be here with us. Max, thank you for being here. Say hello to the audience. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Nice having you here. Thank you, Max. And the second speaker is Christian Borkert. He is an IT lawyer and founder of Euribo Legal and Consulting, focusing on agile and hashtag blockchain and IT sourcing, uh, bridging between business law and technology. He's a senior member of Block Lab Stuttgart and co-author of the blockchain strategy for Baden-Württemberg. And we are shaping... Uh, he is shaping blockchain technology in Stuttgart. And uh, he loves Minecraft and is a co-author of the virtual agile training for procurement using Minecraft as virtual interaction platform. So that sounds interesting. Christian, say hello. Yeah, hi. I'm happy to be here and to share ideas and discuss on our uh, exciting matter. Yeah, nice having you. Thank you. And our third speaker is Zoltan Fasikas. He's the mastermind of Decentravote, a blockchain-based voting protocol for cor corporate governing bodies built by Iteratech. He's leading the blockchain education pro program at the largest technical university of applied sciences in Austria, where he's situated as well. And he's the editor of a scientific journal responsible for a new research topic exploring governance of blockchain and governance 
by blockchain. So, hi Zoltan, say hello. Hi everyone, thanks uh, for having me today. Great. This is exciting and we will develop this from a more technical perspective of governance of blockchain uh, towards governance by blockchain. So, Max, um, I think most of the participants have already heard the term, but still some might not exactly know what it means. Could you please give us a short definition of governance in general? Yeah, for sure. Well, I'd say that there is no one fits it all definition for the term governance, okay? That's simply because the word governance is used in a variety of contexts. So it depends on the subject matter or point of view. For political and social studies, for example, it might be of interest to have a closer look at the process of governing by the government of a state, by a market, um, or by a social system. When we talk about distributed ledger technology governance, we should have a closer look at academic IT literature, where Peter Weil, for instance, defined governance with the topics decision rights, accountability, and incentives. So at a general level, I'd say, you could possibly argue that governance refers to all forms of coordination and patterns of rule among the actors involved in a collective problem. Oh, right. Uh, that really sounds like you're in the topic at the moment. <laughs> so um, in, in maybe, maybe the question to you uh, again, um, in, in case of a blockchain network that is operated by um, multiple entities which form a consortium together, um, what does the governance exactly need to cover? Yeah, as you already mentioned, this question is actually subject of my research. To answer this question, I already spoke to several blockchain experts, practitioners, lawyers, um, and other researchers from different industries, right? Main results so far, it depends. <laughs> so first of all, it depends on the purpose of the underlying network or use case you're looking at, okay? Secondly, and that's what still many people forget when they talk about blockchain, these use cases are located in inter-organizational settings. So apart from the willingness for cross-company collaboration, possibly on a competition basis, you also have to make sure that decision processes on several topics are put in place. At the same time, these decision processes um, should represent the different members in an overall satisfactory manner. To give you some examples for these decision processes I'm talking about, you could think about topics such as funding, uh, on and off boarding of participants, tokenomics for incentivation, role concepts, read and write sets, or technical development in general. But most importantly, you also need mechanisms in place to amend or revise these processes. That's because a governance model for such blockchain consortia is subject to an iterative process as things might simply change over time due to new decisions or new members, for instance. And as I already mentioned, we are talking about inter-organizational use cases, where we might also have to consider legal aspects. Sometimes an own legal entity might be useful or even necessary to cover questions related to accountability and liability. Yeah. I think we will have uh, Christian um, telling us something about right. that later. Um, first, I would like to, to hand it over to Zoltan. Um, uh, Zoltan, can, can you give a specific example for uh, governance and practice so we get this more, more um, tangible? Mm -hmm. uh, I am a member in, in such a consortium. It's called Bloxburg. Bloxburg is a consortium founded by universities and research organizations. They have the goal to provide a public blockchain infrastructure for scientific research. Mm -hmm. So each consortium member operates a permissioned um, validator node in this network, it's based on Ethereum technology, and the consortium members constitute the governing body of this network. Um, the governance rules are defined in a white paper that is public or it's published um, in the internet. And, and this white paper describes the rights and, and obligations um, of the members. For example, keeping your validator node up and running, 
Um, and it also defines how we make individual decisions jointly uh, as members. That sounds uh, very interesting. I'd like to get on that later on, maybe uh, again. Um, for now, I have a different question for you. What, what kind of decisions do, uh, do the members need to make in that kind of a uh, consortium? Mm -hmm. we, we need to, to make these decisions actually again and again. Um, for example, the admission of new members. So if we have applicants, we have to decide if they fit to the network, uh, if they can join the network or not. Um, but also exclusion of members if they misbehave. We haven't had that case um, so far, but it could happen. Then amendment of, uh, of the governance rules, um, technical improvements or improvement proposals, uh, which are filed by the members, and of course, protocol upgrades, so upgrading our nodes. And in order to, to come to agreement uh, regarding uh, all, all these uh, questions, we use on-chain voting. So we use the blockchain uh, and, and we vote uh, or decide uh, by using a blockchain uh, voting application. And uh, our members have different voting rights uh, or voting weights um, to be more precise and it depends on their former participation in, in the votes. Um, and once a year, we elect uh, uh, one member for a very special role we call the Iron Throne. And this is an exclusive role. Uh, it is a role which executes our decisions on chain. Uh, for instance, registers new members as validators. Um, but all of us monitor the actions of, of this member um, and can hold it accountable, of course. Um, so if the Iron Zone uh, would misbehave, then we would fork and elect a new owner of the Iron Zone. I like the wordplay here, the Iron Throne. That's from Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, so ne ne next question directly to you, Zalta. What keeps the members from vi uh, violating the rules? Uh, good, good question. Um, actually, who, who are the members? Our members are renowned professors and researchers. Uh, they represent their universities, um, and their personal reputation is is um, actually at stake when it comes to securing the network. And although we don't have a, a written agreement um, uh, or a written legal agreement, um, each of us consented to a manifesto. Um, stating that we will protect the values um, represented by Blocksburg. But we, we don't have a legal agreement or a legal entity uh, at this time. Is there some sort of a sanction mechanism if someone will violate? Yeah, there, there is one uh, for uh, different uh, misbehaviors. Um, and in, in the worst case, uh, members can be excluded and they need to reapply if they want to become members again. Uh, so all that is written in our white paper and is public and everybody can, can read it. Sounds a little bit like this, this basic idea behind this uh, revolution we have right now, the code is law. I mean, not everything can be written down in the code, but this brings me towards to Christian uh, with the keyword of law. Um, <laughs> do blockchain consortia need a legal entity representing them? Um, I try not to use the typical uh, legal answer or answer also of a lawyer uh, saying it depends. Um, so let's start with a perfect world uh, where we have mutual trust, transparency, fairness, and altruistic purpose of our blockchain consortia. So in this world, we may not need a uh, a, a legal entity because uh, everything works. No, there are no complaints. Uh, they are uh, self-regulated. Um, but in my experience, our world is not as perfect as it could be. So um, if you try to set up a blockchain network providing professional services, the more you have to uh, comply with data protection regulations or other financial regulations, um, the more you probably need 
um, a legal entity representing the network, which is able to close the contracts uh, and so on uh, with the participants. Um, most of um, the legal systems uh, follow the principle of somebody responsible if something goes wrong. So holding somebody responsible um, requires a person, a legal entity, uh, you're able to contract with to hold responsible. So uh, if you go for professional services and infrastructure as a, one of my um, core competency lies in IT sourcing, um, you would like to have a, um, a strong partner, a reliable partner, uh, which you would like to, to hold responsible for whatever happens uh, with the infrastructure blockchain. And it's probably better to have an entity in the shooting line when something goes wrong instead of uh, being personally um, haftungsrelevant. I'm missing the right word here, the English one. Yeah, liable. <laughs> liable, yeah. It is. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I could continue with the, with the next question because it fits good. Uh, which legal forms um, are the best suited ones for, for blockchain consortia? Oh, that's, that's quite a difficult question because, uh, first of all, um, if you have a, a, a blockchain consortia like a, a DAO, a decentralized uh, autonomous organization, um, you need to understand that um, the law is not as decentral like uh, blockchain technology. So we have a, a, um, a dismatch. Um, and um, following um, the corporate laws, uh, there is no international company uh, per se. It's like um, if you have 25 nodes in 25 countries, you could have a longer discussion on uh, where, uh, what kind of uh, entity has been founded by uh, starting the first smart contract uh, governing um, the DAO. So um, first of all, I always recommend uh, a bit similar to uh, Blocksberg um, to agree with all the participants, the initial participants on uh, general principles um, which serve as a foundation um, to, uh, to develop the network and its functionalities. Um, and based upon this um, principles, you could choose a, accordingly a, a, the company uh, form, the legal entity that suits best. Uh, we are about to set up a network in, uh, in Baden-Württemberg, in Stuttgart, um, and we just, for example, agreed on certain principles. Um, we want our network to be independent and neutral. Uh, we want it to be open for everybody, like the internet. Um, it should be technology neutral, but compatible with the FC infrastructure. Um, and um, to avoid that someone gets, let's say, sneaky uh, about profits, uh, we have an agreement that we will have this entity as a non-profit organization. So these are the core principles um, we start with. And um, with the first members, we try to set up um, uh, the legal entity accordingly. We are thinking of a German association or maybe a corporation, but it's not written uh, yet. And it, of course, depends on uh, how f blockchain friendly, uh, I would say, the uh, local government is. I mean, um, when I remember many, many companies went to uh, Switzerland in the first place or Malta because there is a friendly um, legal framework for that, right? So um, that's that's also an important part. Yet, uh, but but the the answer is it depends, I guess, like you said in the beginning. I tried to avoid it. <laughs> I hope you know this. <laughs> Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Um, um, so let's move. Let's move on to to the governance of public um, blockchain initiatives a little bit, um, and let's let's continue with Max. Um, so uh, the public networks they can't rely on known identities to hold the participants accountable. Um, so what does it mean 
for the governance of public blockchains? I'm not going to answer with it depends, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, well, what makes uh, public networks different is the fact that the user group, the participants, the community in general act on an unknown basis. And therefore these networks need other processes to ensure adaptability, upgradability and the handling of unforeseen events, okay? And don't forget, the respective community has to ensure governance consensus on two different levels, the protocol level, but also for the applications built on top. Okay, okay. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe I will directly go to Zoltan. Um, so I suppose that all public blockchain projects face the same challenge uh, of involving their community at some point in the governance, right? Um, so what are the common practices they use? It depends. No, <laughs> just a joke. Um, at the beginning, they, they don't yet have a community, right? So at the, at the very beginning of such a project, the developers and initiators are in charge. Um, in, in many cases, they even belong to a single company, a startup, and later on, um, when the community grows, they can hand over the governance to the community members. It's like uh, and, and the Ethereum, right? They are trying this, Ethereum. Um, not only Ethereum, I'm uh, talking about um, hundreds and thousands of different, different projects and decentralized applications running on Ethereum. Um, and Many of them uh, are transitioning towards a uh, so-called DAO model. Uh, so it's, it's becoming kind of a common practice. Uh, could, could you maybe, I, I think most of us know about the DAO and also the big, uh, uh, yeah, big uh, negative uh, um, headlines we had in the first place where we got to know it. Uh, could, you, could you maybe explain uh, this expression once again? What's a, what's a DAO, a D-A-O? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's an abbreviation for decentralized anonym, uh, autonomous, sorry for that, organization. T to put it simple, it's a digital organization governed by smart contracts running on Ethereum, for example, on, on, on a blockchain, um, hiring humans to perform certain tasks for the organization. So a DAO, for example, acquires funds by selling governance tokens to new members. And it allocates uh, those funds to, to different teams contributing to the DAO, developing new features, for example. And members uh, holding uh, those governance tokens can evaluate the proposed contributions coming from those teams. Uh, they can monitor the, the work progress uh, of the teams. Um, and they decide uh, which proposals will be implemented. And they do it by voting, many of them on chain. It's typical for a DAO to, uh, it's a typical feature of a DAO uh, to use on chain voting on those proposals. If individual members disagree with the majority decision, it, it can happen. They can still sell or, or redeem their governance tokens and just leave the DAO before uh, those decisions take effect. Or they could um, they could split off, right? They could also form their own. They, they um, could also fork um, and, fork, and yeah. found a sub DAO, and that's exactly what happened back then with the DAO. Uh, it had this mechanism of a small group um, forking uh, the DAO uh, into a new organization, uh, and you you know the rest of the story. <laughs> Sadly, yes, uh, but but still, it's kind of the the ideology of a self-organized um, entity that everybody can trust, and it, because it's decentralized and immutable, right? So that's that's uh, still something, and I think there is many many more attempts uh, running right now than in the first place, even though the first one got hacked. So, um, um, and I have the feeling that this. You know, the developers, Zoltan, they should focus more on their projects, right? And not so much on building the administrational functions of the community and for the community. And um, But how much effort does it cost to set up such a DAO? Uh, okay. 
Yeah, you are right. They should focus on uh, on the features of their projects and not on on actually on, on an administrative software as uh, DAO uh, is. Uh, but they can use uh, frameworks the, like Aragon or, or DAO stack you, you might have heard of um, to create their own DAO. So these frameworks um, offer um, features like membership and proposals and voting and fund management, um, all that on Ethereum, uh, governed by smart contracts, just out of the box. You only need a few clicks to create your own DAO. Oh, so it's 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 kind of a, a self-learning as well. So so the, the more experience we get, the faster it gets to to just implement the the experience from the others, right? Yeah, it's kind of an SAP for DAOs or for decentralized organizations. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it to totally makes sense. Why why uh, should everybody have to begin in from from the very start if there's a lot of work already done, right? So yeah. Um, but it needs to be uh, like SAP, adjusted to each and every single yeah, case, sure. right? So, yeah. Um, Christian, um, uh, so this brings the legal part again here. So a DAO smart contracts, they, they manage funds and members uh, make decisions regarding the allocation of those funds. Uh, what, what Zoltan already uh, just brought this example. Um, are there any legal restrictions or implications to that? I mean, who's liable for the decisions? Um, what, what happened in the first hour? Um, uh, maybe let's start with what happened with the first hour, um, because um, in the smart contract of the DAO, it was totally allowed to split up in uh, and to fork into sub -DAO. So somebody, uh, read through the code and said, okay, um, I'm able to do this. It's, it's allowed by the code, so I'm doing it. And he split off uh, uh, quite an amount of, of funding. So um, this is like, uh, then we have the discussion of, uh, so code is, is law or, or law is code. Um, and uh, it, I think the, the quote got quite a hype. Um, getting back to the, um, to the source of the code, which was um, Lauren Lessing, um, working on constitutional law, I think in California and Berkeley. Um, uh, he was very concerned at the beginning of the internet about freedom rights and uh, by um, not getting access to platforms, uh, those rights might be uh, shortened or uh, limited. So uh, his worries about um, law is code, code is law, uh, was more about uh, freedom and the access of, to the internet or certain platforms. Um, it was not so much uh, the idea of uh, what is written in code is equal to law. Um, and uh, we had in our discussion before, um, you mentioned oh, what was the intention of the developer? Uh, what are they going to decide? And so on. And we noticed then that um, you maybe have the DAO, but you have people behind it with certain intentions that try to um, reflect in the DAO. And it's not just code, it's more a, the association of the people driving uh, the entity. When you have a limited company or an incorporated or a German uh, GmbH, so you have some founders, um, shareholders which agree on the bylaws. And then of course you, the, the legal entity is born and then they need like the DAO to, um, they need natural persons to um, take actions um, like the president, CEOs, whatever. Um, and um, of course they can change. And um, it's always uh, the possibility of interpretation. Um, sometimes uh, words, are not as good um, as they should be in um, laying down the basis of collaboration and um, um, giving guidelines to the action. So um, basically the DAO is not acting in a uh, space free of law. Um, and um, of course there need to be somebody responsible. There is some liability. Um, 
the was there is, actually with the first DAO? Was there somebody uh, in a in a liability position? I think no, right? There was no one who had to come up with the funds. Uh, well, step in. Somebody took the funds, and uh, the community says uh, you have to give it back to us. So they hold him responsible, uh, and then they took action and changed the code, as far as I know, uh, and 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 split uh, um, split the the Aldo part off. Um, and this is kind of responsibility in a new way. Uh, it's a technologi technological solution, of course, um, but mainly it's because they didn't really knew who was the guy who took the, the funding. Um, there was nobody to take uh, responsible. There was somebody or a group of persons, we don't know. Um, so they got for the, uh, they, they have chosen a, a, an alternative way and uh, uh, they went for a technological solution. Yeah. Uh, but of course, stealing money <laughs> is still a crime, although it's not written in the smart contract of a DAO. And even if it's decentralized, yeah. <laughs> and even, if, of course. <laughs> Short comment, uh, comment on that. Uh, actually, the resolution of this conflict was that the community, the Ethereum community, um, forked, uh, but not all of them. Uh, and that was the birth of the Ethereum as we know it today, because the original blockchain, the unforked one, is called Ethereum Classic. So since the DAO, we have two Ethereum networks, as you know, uh, the original is Ethereum Classic. Uh, and uh, manipulated one uh, or repaired one or uh, however <laughs> you want to see it is um, Ethereum, the Ethereum mainnet. Yeah. And I, 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 as far as I remember, they had really trouble going for that decision because it meant like um, not being true to the, to the old idea of s developing something that is not manipulative, manipulative from the outside, right? Um, yep. This brings me actually to a good point of, of uh, going towards the break because we already are half time here. And um, I think this has been a, quite a good ride in the, to, to, to get an idea about what governance is and uh, how a, and why a blockchain consortia needs a, a, a governance model and, and what are the different um, things you need to take into account when you set up a, co um, a, a governance model uh, for something like that. And um, I mean, the, the question of a DAO, um, that's probably what we've, they, they could learn a lot out of these failures that were made. And as we see, like the, the discussion we had, we had with the SIP, like, um, uh, development, it, it moves on, everybody learns, we get different settings that were functional over a long period of time. And uh, I think it can move on from kindergarten level to, uh, to a very, very um, uh, serious level of implementational uh, functionality. So um, yeah, let, let us move to the break now. And um, uh, we will have a short video soon and uh, stay tuned for that. It's about the uh, Blockchains Conference 2021. And uh, directly afterwards, we will have the ticket uh, giveaway. And um, remember, I will uh, ask you a question and the first one who gets to answer it will be the winner for the 300 euro worth um, a conference ticket uh, from July 7th to July 9th. And uh, stay tuned for that directly after this short video. Where are we heading? your data.
artificial intelligence. Exciting. I'm really looking forward for that conference and uh, to see people in person again. But I think this format is as good as we can do for now and everybody's doing uh, its best to move to muddle through the situation. And now it's time for the ticket giveaway question. And the question is, grab your keyboards, be ready. What is the first block of a blockchain called? I guess our participants already have an idea. Um, it's not the hardest question, even though I would have to admit, I would have to think a little bit about it. Uh, the answer should be here soon. What is the first block of a blockchain called? The we currently have a problem in reading the chat. We might already have an answer. Uh, just give us a few seconds uh, as we're always seeing this is live. So something like that may happen. Um, I'm really happy that most of the time it functions pretty well. And we are today on a, a new platform like LinkedIn Beta. Um, we are one of the first ones to try directly. Ah, oh, we haven't, we have a winner. Oh, I can't even read the name okay um <laughs> we have the winner it is sudeep shudari uh congratulations the answer is genesis block genesis block is the first block of a blockchain called and i th think uh, i just announced the wrong winner it is rick tuinenburg rick tuinenburg as we said, we have like two different chats running here on Twitch and, and uh, LinkedIn, so it came. We will, we will sort it out. We have like, maybe we have two winners Brett, for now. Um, it would be your, to your favor. So let's move on. Um, the discussion round continues and we will move to the next level, to the next aspect, aspect of uh, governance. It's uh, blockchain in corporate governance. Um, so how do we, how can we utilize the blockchain technology for governance situations uh, within um, different spaces? And Christian, let me start with you again. Um, in corporate governance, so there's like annual general meetings. They are the highest governing bodies of organizations. And um, now in pandemic times, uh, so everybody is kind of in the same situation they cannot really uh, convene presence meetings. Um, so this is a problem, right? Um, is this an opportunity for the digitization of corporate governance? Uh, I think so. Um, at least it's uh, quite a, a strong uh, push into digitalization. Um, it was able before, at least a, a, in, in the German uh, legal system, uh, you could, uh, could have changed the bylaws of a company um, and um, so agree on um, virtual uh, voting in uh, general assemblies and so on and so forth. Um, already in, I think, 2009, there was a, a, a judgment uh, of a court saying there were a Germany-wide organized organization of um, anonymous uh, alcoholics, and they offered uh, general vote, uh, voting in a general assembly by chat. So, um, and they went to court and they won and say, this is possible. So, um, yeah, having this in the bylaws, uh, it's possible, um, but uh, most companies didn't use the possibility uh, so uh, they were just, uh, they were caught by surprise when the um, pandemic uh, break out, 
like many others in the world. So, um, and the uh, government of Germany, as well as many other governments in the world, um, um, found a way and, and made a new law. So um, by dealing with COVID-19, it's possible in a very easy way to do virtual uh, assemblies. Um, and um, you don't even have to uh, have the possibility in the bylaw. So um, right now it's possible. They set up a, a already, I think in April, uh, last year, a new law, uh, and they for, uh, for Germany or for, for Germany, generally for Germany. Yeah. Uh, the uh, government is always for certain countries, so it's for Germany, and then uh, they extended the possibility to the end of uh, uh, next year, so thirty first of December twenty twenty one. Uh, actually, actually, I, I can't really make a deal out of it why they didn't do this earlier, because uh, it's so expensive to have these assemblies always with the people in person there, right? And uh, I think I think when you just mentioned the, the voting via chat, Zoltan is probably turning his head around and saying, wait, that's... <laughs> That's that's crazy and not secure at all. We will move to us towards that, Zoltan. You will you will come there. I would I would like to uh, go to Max first. Um, uh, so there are plenty of solutions enabling electronic decision making. Um, what are the particular advantages of blockchain based voting? Okay. Um, well, I would answer that question from a technical perspective because technically. Distributed ledger technologies offer the possibilities to fulfill requirements of elections, amongst others withstanding external attacks or preventing fraud to some extent. At the same time, votes are auditable um, through the transparency these systems come along with, you could say. Therefore, distributed ledger technologies could possibly uh, ensure election security and integrity. But as always, it depends on the right design of the system. <laughs> for sure, for sure. It needs to be set up right. Um, uh, we, we will hear something from Zoltan uh, towards that because with uh, Decentral World, uh, he already has a body like that. Uh, but first, first, once again, uh, to you uh, and your studies. Um, so you mentioned the transparency. Um, this makes the, the votes auditable, right? Um, because everything is 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 uh, secured on that blockchain network and immutably um, everybody can look at it from the outside like on every bitcoin transaction um, um, but how does this fit together with uh, privacy requirements <laughs> isn't that contradicting okay, yeah. yeah yeah good question um, once again i would answer the question from a technical perspective because there are several ways to ensure uh, anonymous voting and i think Sultan's decentral vote solution provides these features by using so-called um, zero knowledge proofs. Sultan, would you maybe like to tell us more about your solution and um, about zero knowledge proofs? Uh, yes, uh, sure. Uh, so the solution is called decentral vote, decentralized voting, um, and it anonymizes the voters locally in their browser using zero knowledge proofs. The um, technique uh, we utilize is called ZK Snark, um, and it is the same technique as the privacy coin Zcash um, is also using for private payments or, or transfers. Mm, and such a ZK Snark enables you to prove to a smart contract that you possess a secret key to unlock one of the voting rights without disclosing which voting right is yours. So you don't reveal who you are, uh, but you are one of the voters and you can prove it to a smart contract. Nobody knows who you are, but everybody can be sure that you have a, a voting right. And if your proof is valid, then the smart contract registers a new blockchain account that you can use later for casting a vote. Uh, so each vote is a new, a brand new blockchain account um, and this account cannot be linked to any other account you have ever used before. Okay. Isn't There's isn't also no intermediary between your browser and the blockchain that needs to be trusted in some way uh, or secured against attacks. Um, you just cast your votes 
directly from the browser by sub submitting them to the blockchain, to a blockchain node. Uh, and you can verify yourself that your uh, vote have, uh, has been stored and counted uh, by, by smart contracts. Isn't that kind of comparable to the to the old school paper voting that we have like every time? Like I I have to register myself uh, at the voting place. Um, I have to show my passport, but in the end, it is an anonymous paper that is counted uh, by a secure um, um, tamper-proof system. Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, k kind of, kind of, but uh, there are no people, observers, or uh, other personnel assisting the vote. Um, it's rather these smart contracts governing every, every critical step in the process. Um, so beginning with the accreditation of the participants uh, who attend the, the vote or, or um, uh, general meeting. Um, the authorization of the representatives. If you uh, cannot attend, you can authorize a representative and delegate your vote. Um, the revocation of, of voting rights, um, as well as the opening and, and closing of the votes. So all of these steps are recorded um, uh, as digitally signed um, and immutable transactions on the blockchain. Uh, and they are checked by smart contracts. So, so well, may I, I have some question to you, uh, interrupting a bit our, yeah. uh, but uh, could you, uh, this is secret voting, um, could you as well use open voting or covered voting? So uh, if you need it, it would be traceable, uh, but because sometimes uh, company laws require this. Yeah, yeah sure. That, that's a simple case. That's the simple variant. Okay. Um, the, most effort um, or the, the challenge uh, is actually uh, to implement this anonymous voting, secret voting, because the other one, the simpler one, uh, okay. is provided by the blockchain. Uh, oh. So every voter has a private key and by signing the votes with that private key, you can associate the vote to the voter and nobody can forge uh, votes because you need to have this private key uh, to be eligible to vote. So that, that's a simple one, the simple case. Um, the bit more difficult one is the anonymous case. Yeah, I mean, zero knowledge proof actually uh, it sounds complicated, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm quite sure, sure that there are crypto mathematics and, and uh, people like that who's, who've been working on that. And, and uh, Zcash runs quite long and functional, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, there's a proof of work, I would say. Um, <laughs> uh, but this sounds to me like there's like maybe a, a, um, a point of failure because is everything really like stored on the blockchain and everything can be, can be looked after, like also the, the, the um, zero knowledge proof part? Uh, not everything, surely not. Um... For example, you should never store plain text, or it would be even worse, personal information on the blockchain. Um, so smart contracts are only used to, to enforce the rules regarding authorization and workflows in, in the course of the vote. Uh, but textual content like the wording of the resolutions or, um, I don't know, the names of, of the candidates uh, and so on, um, all this content uh, resides in a decentralized storage network. Um, it is only accessible for the voters uh, and it cannot be manipulated by, by anybody because the hashes of that content uh, are stored uh, on chain. Uh, on chain. Um, they, they are secured on the blockchain, but the content itself is not on the blockchain. Okay, okay. Uh, so if, if the, the blockchain itself is tamper-proof and everything that is decided and that needs to be stored on-chain um, is, is tamper-proof, um, there, I've learned from other use cases like in supply chain tracking that, that there's always the, um, the trouble with the, with the data input point. Um, so what about the user interface uh, running in the browser? Um, could it display fake information or uh, could it be manipulated in some certain way? Could it manipulate my vote before it is on chain? No, that, that's, that's a good point. Uh, th that would be uh, true for a conventional web application. 
um, that the system operator um, could manipulate the code um, of this web application that gets downloaded from a server uh, and executed in your browser, uh, and you would not even notice it, probably, because it would look the same, it would behave like the real application, uh, but it wouldn't be the, the real one. In case of this enter vote, um, the, the code of the user interface is also hosted or stored in this tamper-proof uh, tamper uh, decentralized storage. And the hash uh, of the user interface is stored on the blockchain. So before executing the code, um, the browser calculates the hashes locally, compares uh, them to the hashes published on chain, and it just refuses the execution if the uh, code has been compromised. Ah, so we have like, so we have thought of the user interface as well. <laughs> uh, do you do you already um, have like um, corporate assemblies or or um, I don't know the word for fine in English uh, associations. votings or associations association or uh, vote votings or club votings? Uh, do you already have that? Because I you know my my, my mother and father are both in uh, associations at the moment and they had exactly this problem at, at this point and when i told them what we were talking about today they said like oh can you give me the address we need that and uh, I, I, do you already have like practical proof it works and, and it functions on that on that uh, scale level yeah we, we we already have used it a few times and some more general meetings are coming this year in in december um the software is is uh, ready and live since this summer. So it's, it's quite uh, new, but we have already used it a few times for uh, cooperatives, associations, uh, you name them. Um, yeah, it sound, sounds great. Uh, I can I can give you address to my mama, right? <laughs> um, uh, let's let's move forward a little bit from this. Yeah, I, I would say it's a smaller scale. I, I think Zoltan would disagree on that, but I think the the um, using this in public governance is even a bigger scale and it touches like the most holy grail of our democracy, the vote itself. And uh, as we've all seen uh, currently in the United States, there are still a few legal things going on with Trump not exacting uh, in the vote and the Dominion voting system being definitely not on chain uh, as far as I can see it. So maybe there is even uh, touching points um, and it's attackable and we have a completely split country because one half is not exacting the vote. Um, so this is this is basically why I would like to move this forward from this from this uh, scale, Zoltan, that that you already have the solution for. Towards uh, is it possible to to utilize this uh, maybe in the perspective of a few years? But if we have like the will towards, will will we be able to go for that? And um, so the, the first question. Um, I would like to ask all of you, and the first one who wants to step in, uh, just jump for it. Um, is blockchain-based voting uh, ready for national, uh, nationwide political elections? Maybe I would uh, go for this question first, because I'd say no. Um, you just mentioned the United States. There are some providers in the United States, for example, offering such solutions. and. When you have a closer look at these solutions available at the moment, you will find out that they still need some fine tuning, let's say, okay? So they are still defective at some point and cannot yet ensure a secure election process. Additionally, uh, I'd say no due to legal requirements, but I think Christian can answer on this one. Yeah, maybe. Um, so. Of course, uh, elections are, let's say, the secret grail of every democracy. Um, and so every democracy has a bit its own principles. There are no general rules worldwide. Uh, however, there are principles um, of the international election observation, um, which say, oh, we need a public oversight. Um, transparency will not be sacrificed for efficiency. Um, technology will support security and not undermine. And um, yeah, of course, you need laws to protect the voters and the ballots. Um, and very 
uh, important point is uh, it's, it's a bit linked to the observation. Um, the domestic and, and international observers uh, shall be able to effectively witness and protect the election process. So um, using blockchain technology, uh, on one hand, it's, it's supporting uh, these principles. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you maybe need a higher degree on informatics to understand what is happening. So um, democracy is always something which is quite near next to the people. So everybody, it's, it's key to a democracy that every citizen understands uh, what they're doing and how it's working. So um, if you need a eight years study to understand what's happening and to uh, revise uh, the votes, for example, um, it might be a, a major issue. Uh, we had all, we followed the, the uh, press um, headlines on ballots uh, in the US uh, being recounted. Uh, I think one state was about 3 million on upfront costs. Um, so there is a lot of effort in that, but if you do it with an electronic system, it's very difficult to recount it. So maybe we need a different approach. Um, software or technology needs to uh, become more mature so that there is an easy way um, to, to access all these topics. However, there are companies using already uh, a blockchain technology for voting, um, like Estland, Estonia. Sorry. Has anyone of you of you uh, looked into the, the already implemented e-voting system they have there? Because um, I would say that 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 cannot be perfect because it is not <laughs> using blockchain and uh, of th there has to be points of failure uh, for that kind of system. Or, or, or would you say it, it's, it is possible to set up a system like that? Like, I don't know when it was delivered. Um, they, they use it for, for ages now. It's, it's been for the last vote as well. I think they, they used a system in Florida. Uh, Dominion. Is, it's... Yeah, it, it's counting, uh, uh, um, how you call it? Uh, uh, Lochkarten, how, or how you say it in English? Uh, uh, whole ballots. Whole yeah, whole cards. ballots. So yeah. it's just uh, automatically counting. Now they scan it. Uh, but there was quite an um, uh, there was quite a thing. Uh, I think in, in 2008 uh, when they they noticed that the machines are counting in the wrong way. And uh, after a few years of, of uh, processing in um, in courts. Um, the company needed to uh, to confess that there was a software error, uh, which could not consciously tamper with the vote, but which co could uh, count the votes uh, in the wrong way. So um, I don't think that they have a, a system um, that is really um, under uh, uh, so, uh, supporting the um, the voting process, it's more about uh, counting uh, the yeah, votes. Okay. So they scan okay. it and then they they say, okay, uh, it's like counting money. You have all these, uh, you know, that from maybe from the movies, the money counting machines. And there's still something physically produced out of that yes. e-voting. Okay, I, I I get it. That's a, that's a different thing actually. But Zoltan. Um, when we have it in uh, with with the central vote already in place for small scale, um, and let's say we need something like this on uh, for our democracy, something that guarantees privacy at the same time, guarantees that the votes are are uh, tamper proof and always recountable and uh, and and immutably stored on there, so nobody can mess with our voting. Um, isn't that a scalability thing? And isn't isn't IT always about that? What what works in a small scale works in the big scale as well. I mean, letting letting Christian's legal con considerations here a, a little to the side. Uh, you know, scalability is a huge issue uh, in blockchains and and all of them. But I would say uh, let's think big. It's okay, but but let's start small. And, and we should begin, we shouldn't begin with, with such a um, high stake use case like political elections. Um, it's better to, to learn on a smaller scale and improve 
uh, your software or solution gradually. And uh, I agree with my um, colleagues. I wouldn't recommend using the solutions I have seen so far for a national, um, national or nationwide election. Okay, yeah, that's that, that's a clear point. I, I was I was a little bit more optimistic on that actually. That, uh, but w would you agree with me on the point that if it is a good solution, and I think you are already proving that on a small scale, um, shouldn't there be like governmental efforts um, to push in that direction to improve our democratic process? Yes, but l let me tell you why I don't recommend them. My main critique is that they are non-transparent. Um, they, they are not open source. The solutions I, I know, uh, even the one mentioned by Max is not open source. Uh, the only documentation you will find or they provide are some white papers and FAQs actually for laymen uh, on, on their websites. And I have read a review written uh, by MIT researchers. Uh, I don't know if you if you know about that. They decompiled the votes mobile voting app. Votes is, is one of these vendors uh, providing voting uh, applications for presidential elections and so on in the US. They decompiled uh, the, the voting app and they found really severe um, vulnerabilities um, and Unfortunately, and, and that's that's really a pity, people blame um, that on the blockchain technology, and th that's unfair. Actually, you know, poorly designed systems um, of some vendors, they damage the reputation of, of the technology. It's about the same for the for the uh, hacks uh, that happen when um, some some uh, trading platform gets hacked and some some Bitcoin or or, or coins get lost. It's not the the failure of the blockchain yeah, itself. It's, it's, it's the exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the exchange. I have another example. Um, it's Polis. It's it's not that well known, but Polis is built by a renowned Russian cybersecurity firm, Kaspersky. You might know Kaspersky. Mm -hmm. uh, Unfortunately, they also refuse to open source their uh, their code. Um, despite um, their announcement they made a few years ago, uh, I have found it back then on GitHub. Yeah, we will open source it. And uh, today they say they won't. Um, but the same applies here. The documentation is very rudimentary. Uh, I couldn't find any hints on advanced cryptography like blind signatures or homomorphic encryption or or zero knowledge proofs or, or whatever else on their on their websites yeah okay i see i see what you're talking about um i haven't looked into that but okay it's still problematic uh, at, at some points and uh, we should move on from but couldn't we couldn't we like um, exercise a little on on, on uh, like uh, rural not not rural is not the right word um municipal uh scale um for not that important votes like the the nationwide voting i just talked to the major if it's not that important uh, okay yeah your, your point your point <laughs> <laughs> but, but but i think really in the elections um there are a lot of benefits from technology um if you maybe transfer experiences in the corporate world to uh the uh bigger scale of uh public voting um you see for example the the general assembly of the the santander bank uh in 2018 was held uh, with the digital voting tool and um, they got the results faster and uh, it was a record turnout of participation. So they had 64% uh, participating. Um, having a look on the participation in our national, international, European elections, um, this might be a point bringing democracy uh, nearer to the, to the voter. Um, yeah, bringing mm -hmm. up transparency as well. So, yeah, I mean, uh, technology is a tool, right? Uh, and as soon as it provides new possibilities, um, I see absolutely no uh, reason for not 
trying it out. It, yeah. uh, you don't go for the risk if it's something important like a national vote, but uh, or a, even a municipal vote. But still, if there is a possibility to improve, um, we should at least have like sandboxes and stuff like that going on. Um, this brings me brings me on um, to be, before we get the user questions. I'm still waiting for them actually here. Um, the the um, yeah still uh, you can still type your questions I don't know if we have already some of them in the chat so please uh, if you found this discussion interesting or if you would like to ask one of our guests some something specific you have the experts here for now use that uh, oh we have a few ones they're just picking them out right now um, maybe maybe I will before uh, continue with my with my regular question I would like to um, ask each of you uh, always in the end of the show. Um, in your specific, like, sparring pool that you're working in, um, what would you wish from the government, from the regulator, um, to move towards a, uh, yeah, your positive impact the solutions can bring? Maybe... Maybe Max would like to, Zoltan? Okay, thank you. Let, let, let me start um, with an example. I, ha I have an example. Um, I have mentioned votes. It's a startup, it's still a startup. They have a dozen uh, of, of employees. They have a funding of, uh, what, a few 10 millions of US dollars. Just for a comparison, the two major voting machine companies in the US, um, th those are counting those ballots, you know, the email ballots, they have a combined turnover of 300 million US dollars each year. But this is all ridiculous compared to the 50 billion defense research budget of the US. Uh, so just to put it in relation, I don't think that any country, except maybe for Estonia, uh, is, is serious about using blockchain for nation, national um, elections in the near future. Uh, but, but I wish that our government or maybe the EU would uh, be the first to allocate reasonable research funds to this topic. Because then, uh, I'm with you, uh, we would have the chance um, to, to get solutions in a few years, which we could use for electronic voting, but not now and, and not with that funding that is available. But it's interesting, actually, that you go in that direction, because I would have thought you would have asked the government for something to get out of the way of decentral vote, but there's already <laughs> free, free ways open for you or what? <laughs> yeah, what would be nice to, uh, is to have sandboxes. You know, the government could, could say, try it out, um, you get some kind of protection if something goes wrong, um, and whatever you do, backup, you can repeat mechanism the vote and, and so on. Yeah. In, in, in a protected setting, a sandbox, uh, as uh, you would call it, uh, that, that, that would be a good idea, yeah. Mm, but good point, Zoltan. Um, with respect to your point, I'd like to add that it's maybe very important for politically driven projects or fundings, et cetera, to communicate goals, strategy, and um, ways of implementation in a clear and transparent manner. Gaia X, for example. Um, Which one? Not, sorry, I didn't get that. Gaia X. You, Gaia X. Do you know Gaia. the uh, politically driven initiative? Yeah, yeah. Gaia. Gaia I didn't. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, for European a cloud European platform. cloud infrastructure, yeah. right? Um, they did good, but they could also do better with respect to communication of technical details, for example. Yeah, we, 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 we just recently had the talk about uh, that data security uh, and uh, we were thinking about it's already there. Why, why didn't they use blockchain for the uh, Corona app, right? Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's already there. We could have had a, a Europe-wide solution, but okay, let's not get into that. Um, but, but, but maybe a, a, going back to the elections, um, having a look uh, into the... Um, historic techniques we are using, uh, which is ballots and paper and so on, we have quite a track record that uh, they have been manipulations. So I think not, uh, the question is not, uh, would blockchain be the perfect solution uh, for governmental voting, but would it be a better solution? Would it be more temper-proof? Um, and 
I think the important thing is is to start somewhere. Um, maybe uh, you could uh, do it for, I would not choose the word less important, uh, but um, less risky topics like uh, participation of citizens in, in local government, not voting, but you have a lot of things uh, on uh, I don't know where to build the next um, uh, public uh, sports hall or, or whatever. Um, there are a lot of possibilities to engage with the citizens directly using the technology. It's not public voting, but it's a secure um, technology to participate in the public opinion to govern ourselves yeah, and that's actually govern what, what yeah. govern that's a perfect input from you because i've been thinking about this you know we have this four year voting term because it is so complicated to set up this whole process with the with the uh, paper ballot voting and because we need some stability in the meantime so our government can work actually uh and and i think this whole decentral idea behind blockchain would uh, empower like local communities to get more back what in the in the old days when our system was developed um we actually uh, we, we it, it, it was needed so the the centralization of power and decisions was needed so it could work now technology enables us to really like decentralize all these and to to give back uh, a lot of um decision um, making to the people on the local side and that um, that also um, brings back like responsibility for your deeds I mean right now uh, we have like politicians that are at some point not at all uh, holding uh, accountable for what their decisions cause in the long run and um, if there's a local decision being made on a blockchain and somebody said said like uh, if I'm voted I will do this I will build the sidewalk this way uh, and he doesn't hold, stick up to his uh, promises. Uh, he will actually have a, a bad reputation and will not be voted again. I'm, I'm thinking about this kind of uh, evolution of democracy all the time. And I think like blockchain, uh, of course, it's not perfect there. It's, 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 we, we've seen it with a the DAO, there's mistakes. And in democracy, we don't want big mistakes. Uh, but still, I think uh, there's a lot of improvement we could make. And I think, uh, of course, maybe the current government doesn't really want to change that fast. But I think the people should demand that. And um, I think that there are a few yeah, thought leaders already sitting in political positions. Um, we had a few ones at the blockchains conference 219 um and and i think there is a lot of things happening and now we get e-currencies and stuff like that so it it moves forward anyway and policy has to change as well and the voting will as well and i think uh, guys like you are are working on the perfect point for that um i i think we've just now done a little bit too much overtime for our question from the audience but i think i hope we had a, a, a good round here um, and we've, we've given everybody a good idea about what blockchain governance is for a blockchain, how it needs to be set up and how it can be utilized for the um, problems that we have currently uh, with the center of votes. Zoltan has given us a great uh, input. And uh, yeah, let, let us bring this um, nice discussion round to an end. I'm, I'm sorry our time is already over. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to give you a f all a, a short uh, moment uh, to say uh, goodbye, and then I will uh, end the show um, from here on. Start, whoever wants. Zoltan. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Yeah, it was a pleasure. It was fun with you guys. Um, hope to see you next year at the Blockchain Conference. Yeah, uh, so everything said was a pleasure for me as well. Hope we do this again sometime. Uh, I really like to exchange the ideas and experiences uh, you guys have. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll probably see you at Blockchain. 
Oh, you guys will stick in contact anyway, I have the feeling. Uh, Sultan Fasekas, Max Schwarzer, and Christian Walker, thank you very much for participating. And this has already been our third episode of Blockchains Online Live. And I would like to thank um, all the speakers again. But of course, I would like to thank the audience that has been uh, part of this. Um, if you liked it, please make sure that you share it. We will have it on the YouTube channel in the afterward. Um, and we will, of course, post that link in our Telegram channel as well. The YouTube channel is youtube.com slash c slash blockchains. And the Telegram channel is t.me slash blockchains. And um, uh, you can uh, still join the discussion uh, on this topic later on. We will also have an article published um, uh, that kind of goes in the surroundings of this governance issue. Um, if you would like to see specific topics um, in this show for the future, you can also uh, go uh, give us your impressions, uh, your ideas about that in the channels and um, uh, just send us an email or whatever you will find uh, each and every address on our internet site. And um, the next show will be in February. Usually we have the first uh, Wednesday each month, but for January, we will have a break and uh, for february we don't have a topic yet so you might influence on that and uh, yes stay tuned via linkedin we will inform you anyway and now it's time for me to say goodbye for this show and long live the blockchain <laughs>